finally we reach LTE, the long-term evolution, the dominating standard for the fourth generation of mobile phone systems. The story of LTE started 2004, it was initiated by Entity Docomo, and the idea was how can we enhance the UTRA, the Universal Terrestrial Radio Access, known from UMTS, how can we enhance it and optimize the radio access to achieve higher data rates? Because it was quite clear that we need higher data rates for all the multimedia applications. That's one thing. So that was one of the targets to have these higher data rates. So at least downlink, that was the idea, having something like 100 megabit per second, uplink 50 megabit per second. So this target that was higher than classical DSL connections, so fixed networks at home. That was one focus. And the other one was on the round trip time, so the delay. And I hope you remember the delay in GSM UMTS was pretty high. So that's rather in the range of 100, 150 milliseconds between the mobile station and the base station. So, but the idea here was to have a way lower round trip time. Why? Because LTE has also focused on more interactive applications, machine communication between two machines, car to roadside communication, automated vehicles. So that was one of the ideas. We will see if really LTE fulfills the ideas or not. 2007. So uh, the evolved UTRA progressed from feasibility studies. That was the first ideas. Now to approve technical specification. Already one year later, that was the first commercial implementation. 2009, the first LTE services in Stockholm and Oslo available. 2010, LTE started in Germany. So you see, this is much faster from the first ideas to the real implementation. Just when notice LTE is not really a full 4G system. So this is sometimes it's called a 3.9G system because it does not really fulfill all the requirements for the so-called IMT advanced system. I will come back to this. So IMT 2000, that was the third generation. That was UMTS, typically that's what we covered. And IMT advanced, that should be the fourth generation. Okay, so LTE is almost IMT advanced. Now let's have a look into the architecture of LTE from a quite high level perspective. And I think if you look at this figure, well, this should look familiar to you. You see a user equipment, an interface, the LTE version of the UU interface, an evolved UTRAN, okay, and an evolved packet core, that was our core network. So we see UTRAN and we see a core network and we see other packet data networks. Okay, so this is a pretty simplified picture from a high level uh, look on the architecture, but isn't there something missing? Hmm. If you compare this high level picture to GSM UMTS, you might have noticed that on the right hand side, we only have packet data networks. So where's our circuit switching from the classical telephone networks? It does not exist anymore. So LTE is an all packet switched, an IP system. So the evolved packet core is packet switching. There is no circuit switching anymore in LTE. So that's the first important thing we can notice. Okay, so what do we have? We have the user equipment. And as we already know from UMTS, that's pretty similar. We have mobile termination. So handling all these wireless mobile communication things like mobility and handover. I will come back to handover later. Uh, coding, modulation, etc. Then we have the terminal equipment. That's our more or less ISDN telephone, something like this. Well, it's not ISDN anymore because we have packet switching. So we have voice over packet switching, but it's similar. So we have an equipment that handles and terminates the data streams, but it's packet data now. And we have our SIM, 
the Universal Integrated Circuit Card. It's a SIM for LTE and this SIM runs the USIM applications and on the USIM you can run your own apps, you can do many things there. Okay, so user equipment looks pretty much the same compared to UMTS. Then we have the evolved UMTS Terrestrial Radio Access Network, as it is called, the EUTRAN. It was universal, now it's back to UMTS. And this comprises the E node Bs. So these are the evolved node Bs you're familiar with from UMTS. So these are our base stations, but now base stations including the controllers. That's the second thing we notice, okay, we do not have separate controllers anymore, but we have only E node Bs. I will also come back to this, why we only have E node Bs. Plus the UTRAN comprises also the interfaces to the evolved packet core. There's a user interface and a signaling interface. So you see the separation of the user traffic, that's your user data, and the signaling traffic. The acronym MME, etc. I will come back to these as well. Then the third important component is the packet core. That was our core network. It's now called Evolve Packet Core, packet switching only. So here you will find the database for the subscriber and for the equipment identities and the EPCs responsible for routing the data to and from the packet data networks, like the internet, for example. So in the Evolve Packet Core, you will find routers. You will also find different functions for policing, charging, authentication. So similar functions, we already have them for UMTS, for GSM. So the network wants to know who is using the network. I want to charge maybe based on bytes, on whatever kind of usage. There's certain policing, certain rules, who is allowed to use the network, to what extent, what maximum data rates. Maybe I limit the data rates after the use of, let's say, several gigabytes, something like this. So that's the idea. But from the high level perspective, it looks pretty much like our UMTS network, but no circuit switching anymore. So what else do we have? The initial release eight from three GPP has offers, well, higher data rates compared to UMTS. And if we look, for example, at a user equipment category, CAT5 devices, max downlink 300, that's quite a lot, 300 megabit per second, and uh, uplink 75, that's quite a lot. Using already MIMO for antennas on the device, uh, on the base station and then on the device today we also use MIMO but in this case the base station has to use the MIMO functions. So you see depending on the device categories we already offer in the initial release pretty high data rates. So not as high as today's UMTS but 300 that's higher. So you see that's dramatic increase. With the new versions of LTE, we can go up into the gigabit per second. But let's start with the classical LTE. So way higher data rates with so-called LTE Advanced, Advanced Pro, but also lower data rates. Why? I will come back to this. So that's one thing. So higher data rates. The second focus is on lower round trip times. So this is a part of a table that shows different quality of service classes for different applications. So for example, let's look at voice, classical voice. Classical voice, that's a certain quality of service class, class one. It has a guaranteed bit rate in this example, has a certain priority because depending on the application, we can have different priorities and then the system knows when it comes to scheduling which type of traffic is more important compared to others. And then uh, we also see a so-called packet delay budget. A packet delay budget that means, okay, what is the delay we can tolerate? 
yes, we want to have a really low delay, but for example, we can tolerate up to 100 milliseconds for this interactive voice. And that's different. For example, if you look at non-conversational video, so we allow some buffering, then you see, okay, we can have delay budget 300 milliseconds and it's not that important, for example. And then if it comes to some special applications, for example, push to talk. You remember Tetra? So mission critical push to talk, for example, for the police, for firefighters, we need a pretty high priority. So that's really high priority. That's lower than priority one, that's 0 0.7. And we have pretty low delay budget. So oh, oh, we don't like delays here. So it's mission critical. It's push to talk, remember the Tetra idea. But also the packet loss rate, well, that's different from, for example, buffered streaming or signaling compared with signaling. So you see, low delay, but okay, we might lose some of the bits. That's not the problem for voice. So we will still understand something, but we cannot tolerate delays. Then we have, uh, for example, non-guaranteed bit rate, uh, whatever, uh, some, some other things like uh, some signaling, very important, uh, please almost no errors, well, 10 to the minus six, uh, etc. and low delay. So you see, we have new applications in LTE that come with requirements for pretty low delay. We have many different priorities there, but it's all packet switched. I will show you later how you can guarantee data rates in LTE. So we have guaranteed bit rates, non-guaranteed bit rates, different applications. Today, the list is way longer. So this is the initial list from the well, start of LTE, and you see some of the new things already integrated here, this uh, push to talk. Okay, so how did it start? Well, for example, May 2011, we had the first LTE station here in Berlin. Okay, not that big coverage, but and uh, in the early days of LTE, one of the goals was also good coverage on the countryside. So that's quite important. The cells can be large, larger than GSM cells, so 100 up to 100 kilometers, depending on the signal strength. So coverage on the countryside is also quite important. We are still not there yet with full coverage, but LTE is extremely successful. Look at the growth rates. So that's what everyone wants to see in marketing. Yeah, exponential or whatever. So uh, that's what we would like to see. Okay, it will flatten out somewhere, but extreme fast growth rates of LTE. Why? I will explain. So you see, starting from some million connections, 2010, 11, we pretty soon reached 4 billion connections, 2018. And now if you compare LTE with the other technologies, you see we crossed 2018, 2019, this 8 billion line for all the different uh, technologies. And you see the contribution already at 2018 of LTE. Wow, that's almost half of the subscription uses or can use already LTE. So LTE is here to stay for a while. And the important point is LTE will not really stop being used because long-term evolution, that means we, at least right now, will not see a complete revolutionary new technology, but we have a smooth transition from LTE into the use of LTE also in the fifth generation, which is mainly a new radio interface, but not a revolutionary new architecture. So there are some evolutions here and there, but not a clear cut when it comes to the radio technology, for example, from 3G to 4G, as I will also explain. 
So you see, there's still some UMTS, for example, there is still some uh, GSM, but so that's, well, we cannot precisely say what happens in the future, but that's when you now project into the future, uh, we will not have that many other technologies pretty soon. So LTE will take over the majority of the subscriptions. Why? I will explain. Okay, so LTE will stay for a while and it's now the dominating technology today. If you look at the distribution of LTE, the rollout across the world, well, compared to other maps, now we show the not spots, the LTE not spots. So countries in 2019 that did not offer LTE. So and you see all the other countries uh, in May 2020, almost 800 operators worldwide. So 325 already offered LTE Advanced and LTE Advanced Pro. I will explain what the difference here is. More than 200 offered voice over LTE. So for voice over LTE, the network must be able and also the mobile device, the mobile station must be able to send voice as IP packets. Otherwise, the device will fall back into a 3G or a 2G network. So if you cannot offer voice over LTE, you have to fall back into the other networks. We already have more than 100 narrowband IoT networks. What does it mean? I will explain this in some more detail. Narrowband Internet of Things. So LTE networks that do not offer ultra high data rates, but very low data rates for the Internet of Things. And we already have 80 operators offering 5G technology. 5G is not at all a completely new technology, but there's a smooth path from the early steps of LTE via LTE Advanced, LTE Pro towards 5G with the new radio technologies. And there's no end to see right now we will have a 6G and 7G, etc. But so LTE lies the foundation for all these steps. So what is new in LTE? We already saw the delays way lower, the data rates much higher, but also much lower. Why? We'll see. There are some more key features. For example, we have a way more simplified network architecture compared to GSM UMTS network. As we'll see in some more detail, with a so-called flat network, an IP internet protocol based network that replaces the GPS core, which we still had in UMTS. We still had the architecture from GPRS and GSM. And now we have an architecture that is optimized for the so-called IP multimedia subsystem. So we have no more circuit switching. So it's all geared towards internet traffic. The network should be at least in parts self-organizing. Why, for example, if a part of the network breaks down, the network can automatically reconfigure itself. So it's self-organizing. That helps a lot when you plan a network. Then, for example, we have a feature that's called soft frequency reuse. What does it mean? As we'll see, LTE does not use code division multiplexes anymore. So no more CDMA. CDMA, that was a technology we used in the third generation, but not in the fourth generation anymore. So LTE, no CDMA. So we are basically back in a TDMA, FDMA scheme. So time and frequency division multiplexes. I'll give you some more details for this. But the interesting thing is that we can use, for example, a certain set of subbands or part of the spectrum for the cells with a higher output power and all the spectrum operator gets with lower output power. What does it mean? So an operator gets from a, some authority a certain part of the spectrum to operate 
its LTE network. Then the operator can use the whole spectrum with less power for all the antennas. So that's the green part here. So with less power, that means the coverage is only a part of the cell. And then we can use some subbands, we'll see what kind of channels we can use, with higher power. That means only a part of the spectrum covers the whole cell and there will be also an overlap with neighboring cells. So you have to take care that the subbands with higher power, they have, well, different frequencies in neighboring cells. So we are back at this cell planning we know from GSM, from the GSM technology. But now by using different output power for different parts of our spectrum, we can have an inner part with all the, the whole spectrum, all the subbands, and an outer part with only a fraction of the subbands. So that makes cell planning much easier because we can use the whole spectrum for higher data rates if you're closer to the antenna. And we can use the same spectrum for all the antennas and only for the overlapping parts, also for lower data rates, we have to take care that it's non-overlapping, indicated here by the different colors. So soft frequency reuse, that's new. We also can also use multiple antennas, so MIMO technology here. We are way more flexible when it comes to different spectrum, data rates, bandwidth. I will give you examples for this. Lower RTT for interactive traffic, for gaming. The standard also shows smooth transition paths from UMTS, so that's our wideband CDMA. Different other CDMA schemes, CDMA 2000, time division, SCDMA, but now we use a completely different radio. No more CDMA. So, and LTE is really the big step towards the fourth generation, the IMT advanced. As always, you can look up all the specs, the tables, the figures, etc. using 3gpp.org. So why is LTE way more flexible? Well, let's have a look at the frequencies, the carrier frequencies, the operating bands. So you will find LTE on many different frequencies. And that's just a snapshot from the early days. Today you will find higher frequencies, lower frequencies. So many different operating bands. And you see in the table, they had different, 40 different bands at many different frequencies, well-known frequencies, you see around 1900 megahertz, for example, also 850, 800, 850 megahertz, uh, just examples, lower, higher frequencies, around 2000 megahertz, they could replace the spectrum currently used by uh, 3G technology, but also spectrum used by GSM, spectrum used by TV stations or the early digital TV, uh, the DVB T standard. This is why we nowadays have DVB T2 because we reused the old frequencies now for LTE. So many different carrier frequencies, but also different channel bandwidths. So not only five megahertz as the classical UMDS, for example, uses, but also 1.4, 3, 10, 15, 20 megahertz if available. Again, we have TDD and FDD, so the two different duplex schemes, so full duplex, but also half duplex, TDD and FDD. Different modulation schemes, QPSK and different QAM. The access method, now that's what really is different compared to the UMTS standard, so no more CDMA, but we have OFDMA, so orthogonal frequency division multiple axis on the downlink and a single carrier frequency division multiple axis in the uplink. So, but it's FDMA and we'll also see time slot structure. So this is why this is a mix of 
FDMA and TDMA technology, but no more coding. Because in the end, many people said, well, CDMA, nice, but too complex. And we cannot reach the real high data rates or, for example, low energy consumption. Some people even said, well, CDMA, that's good for academia and PhD thesis, but not for real life systems. Well, we have 3G and UMTS using it, but so big discussion. So the initial LTE offered, as already mentioned, up to 300 megabit per second and downlink, 75 in the uplink. It depends on the category of the device. Cell radius, well, LTE can offer some dozen of meters, so small pico femto cells, but also cells up to 100 kilometers. Also supports high mobility, 350 kilometers an hour. So LTE, you can use it on a train, for example, going 300 something, whatever. But also on an airplane, sometimes you have a good LTE reception uh, during landing or takeoff. So uh, yes, so there's also coverage of LTE. So it's way more flexible. That's one of the ideas of LTE. Some questions, some tasks. So think back of this meta high level view on LTE. Why is LTE such a worldwide success? 3G, we saw we still had this different families, different members of the family of 3G standards. Now we all use LTE worldwide. Think in terms of parameters, Think of the architecture. Why is it such a worldwide success? Now look from a certain high level into differences between the LTE and what you already learned about GSM, GPRS, UMTS. What do they have in common? Where are the differences? And then remember, what was the idea of soft frequency reuse? How did this work? Because this is something new in LTE.